Okay, so, so yeah, thanks for coming out. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so, yeah, um, let's get right into it. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, I'm uh, Headless Zeke. Uh, I work on the um, Advanced Security Research Team at Trend Micro. Um, it's a pretty awesome gig because I get to do offensive research all day, um, basically um, find ways to break things and then build cool exploit demos around it. And of course, you know, do the responsible thing and disclose all of the vulnerabilities I find to the Zero Day Initiative, and, and we work with the vendors to, to get all the issues fixed. Um, since I've been working there, I've found over 40 vulnerabilities in different things, mostly IoT stuff. Oh, oh, oh no, oh, please, 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 please. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I also do like to speak at conferences. This is actually my fourth time speaking at DEF CON. Um, for some reason, they keep letting me come back. I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've sp spoken at Recon, RoxCon, TourCon, stuff like that. Okay, so um, when I started this project, I didn't even know what Crestron was. Um, a coworker of mine actually had a couple of old Crestron devices and wanted me to take a look at them. Um, and, you know, I do love to take requests, um, so I said sure. Um, so I thought, like, since I had no idea who they were, um, there are probably some other people out there that don't know what they, what they are and what they can do either, um, so I figured it would be good to do, like, a little intro type thing. Um, so basically, uh, Crestron devices are device controllers. Um, they're fully programmable and customizable. Um, their bread and butter is kind of audio video, that's what they're known for, is like an audio video distribution and control um, type setup. Um, but they're also doing like, you know, the fancy things where you like go into a, a room and there's like a touch panel on the wall and you like click a button and it'll open up the shades and, and stuff like that. Um, and they're also getting into like building management systems, um, they've got the capability to tie back net into uh, your Crestron controllers. I've also seen them used in access control and security settings. Um, you know, like a uh, touch panel on a door, you click the, the button and it'll intercom you into somebody who can let you in kind of thing. Um, anyways, like I said, they're fully programmable and customizable. Um, they've got basically any way you could possibly want to interact with the device. Um, so you can, you can do infrared, serial, um, TCP IE, of course. Um, you can even do like straight relay control, MIDI control. Um, CrossNet is kind of their own little thing. Um, so basically what you do is you write a program um, in what's called Symbol, which is their, their uh, little programming language. Um, and you basically use that to write um, actions to perform on your devices, um, but you can also write UIs, um, stuff like that. Um, the, the main thing, though, is that programming can be very complex, and most people, when they're having Crestron installed in their offices, um, will kind of farm that out to a third-party programmer or installer. Um, that's going to be important to know later on. Um, so, yeah, the two, two um, or first off, the, the main way that you interact um, as a programmer with the, with the uh, Crestron device is through what's called the uh, CTP console, the Crestron Terminal Protocol, and that's basically the bulk of what this talk is about. Um, and then there's also the CIP um, service that's kind of how Crestron devices talk to each other, and it's like a binary protocol. Um, so, so as far as, far as where you can find Crestron devices, basically everywhere. Um, I, I see them a lot in universities, but also like fancy office environments. I know um, our Trend Micro, Micro office actually has some Crestron <laughs> devices in our office uh, that I made sure were secure, not reachable from the other networks. Um, but, but yeah, also, also like sports arenas, like the big Jumbotron and stuff like that can be uh, Crestron install. Um, airports, I've got a funny little thing to say about that later. Um, lots of lots of hotels are putting these in their in the guest rooms um, to do fancy things, like I was saying, with the shades and, and controlling the TV and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, rich people's houses. 
Um, so this is a, a screenshot um, off of Crestron site where they list some of their, um, their major enterprise uh, customers. You can see it's, it's all over the place, like ExxonMobil, Amazon, Twitter, Coca-Cola, um, Raytheon. So really like, you know, both, they've got both of the Cisco's, both food and networking Cisco's. And um, they are uh, not shy about uh, their, their partnerships with Microsoft. They actually like to, to point that out quite often. Um, so basically, um, Crestron is Microsoft's exclusive partner to manage all ABM engineering resources worldwide. Um, so basically, I, I read that as they are in every Microsoft campus across the world. Um, and you know, they're also partnering more, more and more. And um, just like last week or the week before, um, Crestron won the 2018 Microsoft Global IoT Partner of the Year Award. Um, so they, you know, they like to talk about that, but they also have some other like case studies and stuff on their website. Um, so I grabbed a couple of my favorites off of there. Um, so here's the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority. Um, they use Crestron devices when they're controlling and communicating with their train lines and, and stuff. Uh, the Chicago Police Department. Um, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but there's like a little touch screen on every desk. Um, that's a Crestron device. Um, and then this is probably my favorite, uh, the Virginia State Senate. Um, so, so like all, all of those are Crestron touchscreens, and they say like yay, nay, like that's how you vote, it's like clicking on the, on the Crestron thing. Um, I, I liked this especially because in the case study they were like trying to do like the secure voting angle, like you want to make sure your votes are secure, blah, 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 use Crestron. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so, so since, since, we're, since we're in Vegas, um, this is a, a screenshot from a hospitali hospitality showcase brochure that Crestron has that basically lists all of the properties um, on the strip where, that use Crestron, including Caesar's Palace, um, Ari of Dara, all the MGM brands. They actually have a partnership with MGM Brand. Um, so, yeah, there we go, there's that. Okay, so that was, that was a deployment um, as far as products go. Um, kind of their two, their two main flagship lines are the 3 Series controllers, um, which I've got one, uh, got an MC3 right there. Um, and then they've got touch screens, which are also very popular. Um, and again, I've got a TSW760 right there. Um, those touch screens are uh, being deployed in like a one in every room type type deployment. Um, so you'll see these in like um, every conference room in an office kind of thing. Um, but they don't just do that, they do like a lot of <laughs> different things. Um, I, like, I could spend an entire career looking at just restaurant things. Um, so, uh, Platform-wise, uh, two main platforms. They've got uh, their Windows platform, which is uh, mostly Windows CE, uh, but I've seen mentions of other versions of Windows. Um, I haven't come across them, uh, but apparently they're out there. Um, and then the touchscreens um, you are actually Android tablets. Um, and they've also got um, their video processors and digital media streamers that use Linux. Um, so, so basically, if, if something I talk about today is specific to the Windows side or the Android side, I will try my best to point it out. Um, I have kind of a small sample set, so I'm, some of them are like, I don't know if this is specific to Windows, but whatever. Okay, and just a, a quick little note about the firmware images on them. Um, so the MC3 firmware um, was a, uh, basically a zip archive of WinC ROM images. Um, should be able to emulate it, but I haven't gotten that working yet. Um, I used the dump ROM tool to dump the, um, the file system out of the OS image um, so that I could look at it. Uh, there's the file types of the binaries in there. Um, also, 
also interesting to denote that in the firmware they actually still have like the Windows CE debugging tools that lets you connect like Visual Studio to a Windows CE device to debug it and stuff. It's just kind of interesting to see those still in there. And then for the TSW, um, again, it was a zip archive of Android system images, um, so it had everything you would need to run a full Android system inside the firmware image. Um, the system image was an EXT4 file system, um, so I just mounted it and got access to the file system that way. Um, there's the file types, 32-bit um, ARM. Um, and I did most of my actual in-depth um, reversing on this platform um, because I'm more familiar with that than I am with Windows CE. Um, and the binaries I could get them to, to um, disassemble cleaner, cleaner. Um, so I just spent most of my time there. Um, and I used the Windows platform to kind of like, you know, verify some things and then find some other like simple things like hidden commands and stuff. Okay, okay, so we know what they are. Um, now we need to be able to find them. Um, one of the first things I always look for when I'm starting a new IoT project is a discovery packet. Um, and Crestro did not disappoint. Um, they have this magic packet. Um, I think that might be uh, the CIP protocol. Um, I haven't gone into like what what the bytes signify or anything because I didn't really need to. It wasn't important for my purposes, um, but it would be something to look at in the future. Um, so yeah, you send this packet to um, 41794 broadcast. Um, you're going to also do a unicast, which um, will be important for my next slide. Um, but the response you get back from all the Crestron devices contains their host name, uh, the model, the firmware version, and the build date. So, you can add it to show again. <laughs> uh, so now you can look for, for Crestron devices that are connected directly to the internet. Um, usually there's around 20 to 23,000 of these directly connected. Um, the results of models show that it was um, like the two most uh, deployed devices that were connected directly to the internet um, were an even split between a CP3 and an MC3. Um, and then for those Eagle Eye observers in the audience, um, that's actually the uh, Las Vegas airport. Here, the, they have a Crestron device connected directly to the internet running at the airport. Okay, so, all that said, what is Crestron? Well, there are a lot of different things running different programs on different platforms in different environments. But, I did find a couple of universal truths, and this is where we get into the good stuff. So, universal truth number one, unauthenticated admin access to the CTP console by default. <laughs> okay, so, so um, the CTP console I mentioned earlier, um, but it's basically a, a, a telnet console um, connected or um, listening on port 41795, um, and it gives you a lot of uh, built-in commands that you can run to control the different aspects of the of the controller. Um, it's got a uh, sandbox file system, um, so just limited access, and you can like upload and download files within that sandbox. Um, Auth, uh, they actually have some really good authentication mechanisms. Um, you know, they've got different access levels and active directory tie-ins and encryption, but it's all off by default. Um, and nobody, you know, nobody turns it on. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned earlier, you, you kind of like, the complexity of these systems is so great that you kind of have to rely on a uh, security conscious programmer um, to know that they need to enable authentication. Um, and they end up like concentrating more on getting all of the moving pieces working together than they do like working together and also having to enable security and, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's just another headache that, that it just doesn't happen. Um, and on top of that, it's not exactly um, a one-step process either um, to get an authentication enabled. Um, so it just never gets turned on. 
So when you connect to the CTP console, you get like the little header that tells you what device you're connected to. Um, and if you run it, who am I? An anonymous user, an administrator. Okay, so once you get in, um, basically the, the standard things, I mean, you, they give you a lot of commands. I'll show you in the demo, but a lot of commands available by default. Um, but some of the basic things you can do is change, like bring up um, different services, um, like they've got a web server on there, SSH, telnet, FTP. Um, the Android tablets actually have a SIP server running on them um, to do that, that intercom thing at the door that I was mentioning. Um, you can also get access to all of the network info, like the IP address and the MAC address, which is also going to be important in a minute. Um, and then you can also do arbitrary file, file upload uh, within that sandbox um, using the FGF file and FPUT file for um, HTTP or FTP file transfers. And then they also have X modem um, available if, if you're old school. And then you can also do firmware updates and program updates. Um, if you got, if you made a program that um, takes in commands. Um, you can send that program command through the CTP console. Um, and you can just mess with people by sending um, different things to the, to the on-screen display, um, like messages, and you can play audio and video files and whatever, have fun with people. Um, so that was fine. Um, but I knew that typing help all and seeing the list of commands, that, that probably wasn't all of the commands that are on the thing. Um, so I started pulling apart the, the, the binaries for the services, and I ended up finding a bunch of hidden commands that are completely undocumented that you also have access to. Um, so you can see all of the running processes. Um, this is outside of the sandbox. All of these uh, binaries are running outside of the sandbox. Um, you can also view and modify all of the stored SSL certificates on the devices, um, which could come in handy for certain, certain things. Um, this, this one was just kind of funny. Um, Dr. Watson is on the, the Windows CE platform, so it could help you with debugging crashes. Um, this one I thought was really cool. You can actually directly talk to the chips on the board using I squared C. Um, so, so you've got, got like your, your, your double EEPROM, EEPROM, your um, video, video decoder and stuff. Um, thought, thought that was cool. I've only, only seen that on Windows CE. Um, and actually, I, I think I've only tried that on my MCC3. Uh, so, so I don't know if that's like a widely used command, command or not, but it's there. Um, the, the real fun stuff that you can do, though, is on the Android platform. Um, so you've got this browser open and browser close, um, where you can like open up the Chrome browser and direct it to whatever website you want. Um, you can also um, send key presses and uh, touches to the, to the UI of the Android device. Um, so essentially like you know, full control remotely um, of the Android tablet. Um, and then you can also record uh, audio from the microphone remotely. Um, by just running this command, uh, you give it the name of a file and the length of time you want to record, and it'll dump audio from the microphone uh, to a file that you can download via the FTP on the device. Um, you can also control like mic volume and, and stuff like that, so pretty awesome. OK, let's get into our first demo. So, so I think my, my, my MC3 is starting, starting to die on me, so I have to, to like begin to, to wake it up before I can use it. There we go. Okay, okay so, so um, this is my, my, my scanner. Um, and it basically like sends, sends out the magic probe um, to the broadcast. And then parses all of the um, all of the uh, return values I get, and then for each IP address that that um, that sent me a response, 
Um, I'll open up the, or I'll attempt to open up a connection on their CTP console and run the Who Am I so that I can um, enumerate what user I am. Um, So, running that, what is going on with that again? Okay, uh, so, so running that, you can see I've got uh, 192.168.1.3, it is the MC3. Um, there's the firmware that it's running, the build dates, and you can see open CTP console running as administrator. Um, and then on 192.168.1.2, uh, that's a TSW, um, again, firmware, and the CTP console is open, but you'll notice it says unknown. Um, and I, if, you, if you look at the, at the binary that handles this, um, you can see it's doing like one, one check for one value, and if that, if that check returns false, then it defaults to unknown. Um, so I guess that just doesn't work on the, on the Android Linux. Um, platform. I'm honestly not really sure about that. Um, so let's try connecting to the MC3. Everybody see that? Uh, down at the bottom of the screen, should I try that again? Hang on. Um, can everybody read that okay? So, so basically, if you type help all, you can see like they give you a huge amount of commands uh, that you can run, like a lot of commands. Um, and one that I'm going to run, I don't know if I even mentioned this one, but um, so. So yeah, IP config, you can get like the MAC address remotely even if you're not on the same um, subnet as the device, um, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, who am I? Oops. Who am I? So, anonymous administrator. Um, so, let's connect to the TSW. So again, huge amount of, um, of the com commands available. Um, you can see there's a lot of SIP stuff on this one that you have access to. Um, media stuff. Um, so kind of cool. Um, if I do like browser open, and you'll see like the Chrome browser pop up on there, I think. And I could do like, you know, browser close to close it. Um, so kind of cool. Um, if I do like, like DIR, you can see this is not the full file system, um, but this is all you have access to. Um, so, you know, kind of cool, whatever. Um, but I'm a very greedy person. Um, so you have a significant amount of control on, over these devices so that they just give to you out of the box. Um, but I, I wanted more. Um, so I, I started looking for ways that I could escape out of the CTP sandbox and get full control over the OS. Um, so I was looking around at the different CTP commands and I found something interesting when I came to the sudo command. Um, and apparently I wasn't the only one who found this either. Um, but yeah, so so, um, so yeah, something interesting in the sudo command where you can see there's like a cr eng super user, cr super user, and then this binary um, supwd generator um, thing that they're calling, um, which leads me to universal truth number two, secret engineer backdoor accounts. So, um, the, yeah, the two accounts, uh, CR super user and CR ENG super user, um, I found out like 
like this week um, that these were also simultaneously um, submitted by Justin with Security Compass or Jackson with Security Compass. Um, like I, I seriously had a lot of um, vulnerability advisory collisions on this. Um, hardly ever happens to me, and these were all like all of us submitted these within weeks of each other. It was really super coincidental and, and crazy. But yeah, shout out. <laughs> Uh, so this, uh, these backdoor accounts are present in all their current products that implement the sudo command, I believe. Um, again, my sample set is a little limited, but I, I think um, the way they work is uh, they've got unique passwords for every device, um, which is like a 16-character alphanumeric um, randomly generated password. Uh, but it's actually algorithmically generated based on the MAC address of the device, which I already showed you we can get through the, the CTP console. Um, so that would have been, okay, this is probably the only time you'll ever hear me say they should have hard-coded the passwords in the firmware. Um, because if they, if they had found some way to hard-code the password and just burned it into the firmware, if it was unique per device, that would have been fine or if they generated it based on something I couldn't get remotely, also fine. Um, but instead, um, they based on something I have access to remotely through the CTP console, and they included the generator algorithm in the firmware. So, I was able to reverse engineer the generation algorithm. Um, so, so stick with me here, it's, it, it, it's complicated. Um, so basically, you start out with a, a SHA-1 digest. You populate it with a MAC address um, and a static string. Um, there's a different static string for a CR superuser and for a CR ENG superuser. Um, so depending on which one you're trying to use, you have to use the, the right static string. Um, so you take that SHA-1 digest and you use that as the key for an RC4 cipher with no ID. Um, and then you use that RC4 cipher to encrypt a second static string. And then the resulting encrypted string, um, you go through each character of that and modulus it with 62, which is the length of their, their character set, and then use the result as an index to pick a character out of their character set. And then you end up with a 16 character alphanumeric password for your super user for that device. And if you're super lazy, I also implemented it as a Ruby script or a Ruby function. So there you go. You can enjoy that when, whenever my slides get released. Okay, so what can you do with the, the engineer backdoor accounts? Um, so the CR ENG super user uh, enables even more hidden commands. Um, so on the Windows CE side, um, you can actually do console debug commands, and then it'll list out all of the commands, even the undocumented ones. Um, so that's pretty handy to have. Um, also on the Windows CE platform, they give you access to regedit, so you can edit the registry of the device, and they give you a launch command, which actually lets you execute any executable on the device, even outside of the sandbox. Um, and then on the um, Android side, they've got this telnet port command um, that lets, it, it gives you options on or off, and then that lets you turn telnet on or off. But, but when you do that as um, the CR ENG super user, they give you a third option, which is telnet debug. Um, so when you do telnet port debug, um, it actually opens up a shell on the, on the device that you can connect to. Um, outside, outside of the sandbox. And as, as far as CR Super User, I actually haven't found a, a use for that yet. Okay, okay. so let's, let's go, go for some more demos. Everyone still, still with, with me? me? Okay. So, uh, what I do 
do with an AMC3. Um, you can see here's the, the generating the password based on the MAC address, um, all that stuff. Um, so I connect to the CTP port on the AMC3. Um, I run ESTAT, which is a command that also gives you a MAC address. Um, I parse that out, send it, and generate the password for the engineering user. And then I basically use the regedit command um, to disable authentication for Telnet. And then I launch um, tel Telnet Zero. Um, and that gave me a Telnet shell outside of the sandbox on the MC3 devices. Um, and then if we look at... The TSW side, it was much, much, much more straightforward. Um, so again, um, generating the password, uh, running the ESET to get the MAC address, um, and then all I do is run Telnet debug, um, and it opens up a, a debug shell for me. All right, so let's run those. Let's try the, the TSW one. So if the demo fail, hopefully both of my demos don't fail. There we go. This one's cooler anyway because it's an actual... And so now if you do like LS, you can see you're actually like outside of the outside of the CTP um, file system and have full access to the to all the good stuff. Um, I found out um, it's actually uh, running Lollipop, um, like Android five one one, I think. Um, so kind of out of date. I don't know if that will change in future firmware versions or not. Um, but yeah. So okay. So. Debug shells, and the back doors, awesome. Okay, so that was that was awesome. That was a fun thing to find. Um, but also, since it's DEF CON, uh, we should talk about some some uh, RC evils. Um, so I found uh, twenty two command injection bones on the Android platform. Um, I actually had to cut myself off um, because I kept like finding more volumes while I was recausing other volumes, and it's like, like I got to get these advisories. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the ping command, uh, vulnerable to command injection. This is another one of those collisions that I found out about after the fact. Uh, but but uh, yeah, Kale and Jordan uh, from Rapid Seven also found that one, um, and then Dur um, was also found by Jackson. Um, but then there's also like at user CD, CD copy file, like basically anything that takes like a string from, from the user. Um, so kind of a uh, uh, typical, this, this uh, sub function was actually called quite a bit uh, by other, by, by various commands. Um, and so you can see there the disassembly and then the decompiled version of that, that disassembly um, on the right. Um, you can see it's pretty straightforward, just like, um, you know, build, build up that string based on the, the input you're given, and then send it straight to system. Um, so, super, yeah, super easy. Um, 
I noticed that these commands seem to be, um, you know, programmatically handled on Windows CE. Um, so, so, you know, they weren't they weren't vulnerable to the same command injection as on the Android platform. Um, I don't know if that's because their programmers are more familiar with Windows CE because they've had a longer history with it or what. Um, don't want to guess. Um, but yeah, everything was just kind of punted to shell on Android instead of handling it in code. Um, most were super simple to exploit, like is there backticks, whatever commands you want to run, backtick. Um, there were a couple of them that were more difficult. I had to jump through some hoops to get, get exploits out of those. Um, so like route add and route delete, um, they take whatever argument they're giving and they upcase it before using it. Um, and since this is a Linux-based platform, um, commands are case sensitive, um, and there aren't any useful all uppercase <laughs> commands um, that I know of. Um, so my first solution was to create a shell script um, filled with the commands that I wanted to run, um, and then call it all capital blah, um, and then upload it with that arbitrary file upload from earlier. Um, so I could just get it into the, into the sandbox. Um, but the uploaded script didn't have execute permissions. Um, and dollar shell and dollar bash were not set. Um, so I found out, I actually learned this while I was doing this. Um, so, so normally when you use dollar zero, it gives you a reference to the calling program. Um, but apparently when you're doing this uh, from within a system call, $0 actually gives you a reference to the shell, um, which kind of makes sense because a uh, system like spawns a new process that will be a, a, an actual shell. Um, so using $0, I was able to get a reference to shell. Um, so then the final injected string was dollar zero dollar IFS uh, for an internal field separator um, because it all had to be in one argument, and then dot slash blah, and then it would actually run my my shell script. Um, I found out much much later um, that dot is actually a Unix command. I never knew that before, um, but it works kind of like source. Um, so I could have also used dot instead of dollar zero, but whatever. Whatever works. Okay, so final demo of my talk. Okay, so we already got a root shell. Um, I've, got, I've got an exploit that, that could give us another type of root shell on here, but not good enough. I wanted to do something different. Um, so, So what, what, I, what I did, I um, used that, that command injection bool, um to modify uh, one of the config files that controls all of the streaming settings. Um, and then I used the, the command injection again to restart the CSIO service to pick up those changes. And then all of a sudden our GSP streaming started working. Um, so I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. First, um, let me connect to. Hang on. So, let's see. Let's see. Oops. Okay, so you've got your file system. If you do like. I, I love this example because it's so like immediately obvious that it works. And all of a sudden there's a test.txt in there. So if you do like, you can see it, you're running, as, you're, you're injecting commands as root. I just love that example. Okay, so, so let's, run the, let's run the good script.
So a, a very important thing to note is that there is no change on the touchscreen to indicate that it's now remotely streaming from the webcam. Um, and did I, did I mention that these uh, things are being used in like hotel rooms and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's my, my final demo. So, so let's wrap things up. Um, so, so the potential for good security practice is there in these devices, but the problem is that it's just turned off by default. Um, so you have to rely on either installers and programmers to, to do it for you, um, or if you know that this problem exists, then you can do it yourself, um, which is kind of one of the reasons why I like giving talks like this, is informing that the problem is actually there. Um, but basically, bottom line is if security isn't enabled by default, it's not going to get enabled. Um, so it really um, is dependent on Crestron making the changes, um, which they have. I'll get to that in a second also. Um, so yeah, this was an interesting situation um, because of the uh, types of environments where these things are deployed. Um, it makes it so there's a high potential for abuse by insider threats. Um, so, so, like, you've got these things in all of Microsoft's boardrooms. And then let's say Microsoft has a disgruntled employee somewhere in the world. What are the odds of that? Um, so they can actually use things like this, like recording from the webcam and the microphone um, to do, like, corporate espionage and, like, snoop on the boardroom meetings and stuff. Um, and then, of, of course, the, the hotel the hotel room thing, um, like so. So usually you say like, oh, we're going to put these devices on a, their own isolated network, so all the press on devices are separate from all the other things. Um, but then you have the situation with the, the hotel room, where just some hotel guest goes into a room with one of these devices, pulls it off, plugs it in their laptop, and now they can reach all of the other ones in all of the other hotel guest rooms. Um, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the Android platform seems way less secure than the Windows CD platform, which caught me off guard at first, um, because, you know, I immediately, like, oh, Windows CD, ha, 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 so insecure. Uh, but they actually did a much better job on the Windows CD platform than they did on the Android platform. Um, so I don't know if they're, they're just, like, starting to spread themselves too thin with, with moving to different platforms or what. Um, but so, very, very important slide. Um, Crestron has released updates to address all of the issues that I discussed today. Um, I actually got word earlier this this week um, that my advisories for all of this stuff were finally going to be released um, yesterday. <laughs> um, but yeah, Crestron has released updates for all of this stuff, and uh, more importantly than that, um, enable authentication. I mean, it's a few steps to, to get it enabled, um, but you should definitely do that because if the actual decent authentication mechanisms are enabled, then none of my attacks, I couldn't even get into the CTP console to pull off any of my attacks. So, And um, as usual with these kinds of projects, um, I've got lots of work that I still need to do. Um, so, so there's lots of stuff still on the CTP platform. Um, there's way more homes that I you know, haven't been, haven't been scratched the surface of yet. Um, but there's also like the simple uh, programming language that, that uh, might be good to audit. Um, the the pop files, which are the firmware files. Um, and then, I mean, there, there's a crazy amount of other services listening on these things also, like the IP, HTTP, uh, SNMP, you know, you name it. Um, and then, of course, they've got um, a slew of other products like XIO Cloud would be cool to look at and um, XPanel, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, um, the last thing, the last bullet point on this, um, IOAVA um, is kind of just like like whis whispered rumors at this point. Um, but what that stands for is Internet of Audio Video Alliance. 
Um, so it's a partnership between Crestron, Microsoft, and Intel um, to make like an embeddable um, device that, that can go and turn all AV equipment into the Internet of Things equipment, basically. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out for in the future. And then, yeah, that's it. Are there, there ways, ways that you can reach me if you have any questions, questions or, or just want to chat, chat about stuff? stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. There, there you go. go.